No More Deaths is an organization that leaves food and water in the Sonoran Desert of southern Arizona with a goal of helping migrants crossing the wilderness of the U.S.-Mexican border to survive. They were founded in 2004 by a group of Christian clergy and Jewish leaders in response to an increase in deaths of migrants in the area, an increase they lay blame for on the U.S. government, on Operation Gatekeeper particularly, which militarized the border, particularly at urban crossings, pushing migration routes into the wilderness. While nothing No More Deaths does is illegal, and in fact, it's commanded duties within the religions of the founders of the organizations and therefore protected religious speech, the U.S. government has arrested many of the organization's volunteers over the years. In 2005, Daniel Strauss and Shanti Sellas were arrested for transporting three severely dehydrated and starving migrants to a hospital. Their case was thrown out. In 2010, Daniel Millis was convicted of littering for leaving jugs of water in the desert. His conviction was overturned. And I first heard of No More Deaths in 2018, when they published a report accusing Border Patrol of destroying those water and food supplies in the desert. Hours after the report was released, No More Deaths volunteer Scott Warren was arrested and charged with felonies for harboring undocumented migrants. After a hung jury during his June 2019 trial, the U.S. government tried again. That time, he was acquitted on all charges. The government keeps harassing No More Deaths, falsely arresting them for crimes they know won't be convicted to try and scare them off. No Wall They Can Build is a 2017 book written anonymously by a volunteer with No More Deaths, which, quote, describes the U.S.-Mexico border as I've experienced it since 2008. The author is writing at the beginning of the Trump administration and continues the book's introduction by saying, I hope this book will serve as a reminder that all was not well during the Clinton, Bush, or Obama years either, and that the issues I address here will not be resolved by simply putting the right people back in charge. The question is not who should manage the border, it is how to abolish it. It's good that you keep the bones here, Jesus told me. We were standing in front of a large pile of bones, mostly deer and cow, that our volunteers had collected from the desert. The animals suffer from hunger and thirst as we do. They are hunted as we are. They die alone as we do, and nobody knows or cares. It's good that they should be remembered also. Jesus was working at a muffler shop in Bakersfield, California, when he got deported. His wife and children were waiting for him there. They had been waiting for six months while he was stuck back in Michoacan. When he found our camp, he had been walking through the desert for six days, alone and half mad from dehydration and exposure. His shoulder-length black hair was tied into a neat ponytail. He was wearing a weather-beaten denim jacket faded blue jeans, a handsome belt buckle, a simple necklace, and a well-fitted black t-shirt from a Southern California motorcycle club. Even after such a terrifying ordeal, there was no denying that the man had style. They treat us like animals, he said. Jesus is home now, welding mufflers and raising his children. Before he walked out of our camp and back into the desert, he found a gigantic heart-shaped piece of driftwood in the arroyo painted it blood red and placed it on a waist-high pedestal of rocks he painted white. This is our heart, he told me, the heart of the people, all of us, of everyone who walks here, of everyone who works here, of everyone who died here, of the cows and the deer and the rabbits too. Maybe someday things will be different. I'll come back down here to visit And we'll all sit around this thing and tell stories about everything that happened. May we live to see the day. No Wall They Can Build is punctuated with stories like this one of the author's encounters with migrants while volunteering with No More Deaths. In the first chapter, the author lays out their view of the border. Quote, 
North America comprises a single economy, which is divided by two major borders. One runs between the United States and Mexico, and the other between Mexico and Guatemala. Many people are compelled to migrate across these borders by pressures largely beyond their control. The objective of both American and Mexican border policy is not to stop this migration, but to manage and control it to the benefit of identifiable sectors of both societies. And with the deaths of thousands of people as the predictable and intended result. Ultimately, immigration controls in this part of the world amount to a form of systematic segregation in which the movements and civil rights of certain people are curtailed due to their place of birth. In other words, apartheid. It's the phrase benefit of identifiable sectors of both societies that really caught my attention here. Immigration is regulated by the U.S. border policy and patrol not stopped, and these regulations are enforced or not enforced for the express benefit of business interests. For instance, the author points to the so-called unaccompanied minor crisis of 2013 and 14. Suddenly, border patrol in the U.S. was letting women and children from Central America found in the desert go free, and not just that, but dropping them off at safe points. Normally, Central Americans would be deported directly back across the border to Mexico, despite the fact they were not from Mexico, and that that act was illegal, dropping them off into Mexico, or dropping off children alone. That's pretty clearly child abuse under American law. Word got around that Border Patrol was relaxing for Central Americans, and funnily enough, this coincided with Mexican authorities at the Mexico-Guatemala border issuing travel visas to Central Americans en masse. The author says that the reason became clear when they encountered these migrants in the Arizona desert. Indigenous people in Western Guatemala were being cleared out, one by the drug cartels wanting to use the area for trafficking, but also by mining corporations, Canadian companies, looking to extract resources. Now, maybe this is all a coincidence that at least three governments decided to relax their borders in action that no doubt saved some lives. And it just so happened that mining corporations and cartels made money from the sudden lack of people in the area. Is it less likely that it was a coincidence and whim of goodwill or that it was a conspiracy to clear the land? Who can say? In the US, we can see that migrants frequently end up in some of the most abusive industries in the country meatpacking and farm work and service industry jobs. And indeed, whether through displacement by capitalistic forces at home or economic enticement to the north, it's hard to say if many of these migrants are more migrants or more economic refugees, seeking safety and the means to life like any of the rest of us. The author calls the distinction arbitrary and points out that most migrants are a combination of both factors. And that fleeing poverty is fleeing violence. Further, in previous generations, maybe many of these migrants would have been seasonal employees coming to the U.S. to work for a time, perhaps a harvest, then returning home. But the hardening of the border made such seasonal migration untenable, forcing these workers to stay in the U.S. year-round to avoid death. So because of U.S. border policy, the U.S. is now these migrants' permanent home. And indeed, many people crossing the desert are actually returning home to their families in the U.S. after having been deported to places they had not lived in decades, if they had even ever lived there at all. And no wall that can be built could keep you from your family, right? From your home. I've spoken previously on this show and on Fox and Friends one weird morning of Edith Espinal, a woman who lived inside the Columbus Mennonite Church, my church, for about 1,000 days during the Trump administration because she was facing imminent deportation, being sent to a place she has not called home for 25 years since she was 16. She moved to the U.S. and then to Columbus, Ohio, in the year 2000, where she has three children and a husband. To be 
to deport Edith would not be sending her home. It would be sending her away from home. Thankfully, with the arrival of the Biden administration came a change in deportation priorities, and Edith was able to leave the church without fear of being separated anymore from her family and her home. While Edith's situation has certainly improved, it is important to point out that she is not free. She was checked in in person at ICE offices every quarter, and instead of wearing an ankle monitor, must instead keep an app on her personal cell phone that tracks her location and who's know what other aspects of her privacy if that app is invading. See, U.S. border policy is itself a lucrative business, not just in the form of the $71,000 a year average salary for the 20,000 border agents, but also for the private prison companies like CoreCivic that run the holding facilities, for companies like Wayfair that supply those prisons, for transport companies, and for app makers, no doubt selling Edith's info to whoever might want to track her, for whatever reason. As the author puts it, a policy of pushing migrant traffic into extremely dangerous areas does not imply an actual intention to stop or even deter people from entering the country illegally. This complex and perverse strategy has numerous advantages. It allows politicians to look tough on the cameras while still providing the American economy with the farm workers and meat packers it depends on. It provides ample opportunity to swing huge government contracts to giant corporations. For example, to Wackenhut and G4S for transport migrants to Core Civic to detain them, to Boeing to build surveillance infrastructure. It justifies the hefty salaries of the 20,000 people who work for Border Patrol. On the whole, border militarization is best understood as a massive government pork and corporate welfare project. And that's just the legal side. No doubt there are border agents themselves who are in the drug and human trafficking trade, or at least taking payoffs to look the other way. But there's also the fact that the cartels themselves only make money from trafficking migrants over the border because of the militarization of the border. The cartels only make money from the drug trade because marijuana remains illegal in much of the US. So how do we fix the border? The author points out that the border policy is working as designed. It's designed to kill people. There's no reforming or fixing that. There's no hammering two by fours to the wall to fix the problems of a foundation of sand. As the author says, I am not interested in helping the authorities figure out how to fix the mess they've created. Ultimately, the only hope for a solution to the border crisis lies in bringing about worldwide systemic change that ensures freedom of movement for all people rejects the practice of state control over territory, honors indigenous autonomy and sovereignty, addresses the legacies of slavery and colonization, equalizes access to resources between the global north and the global south, and fundamentally changes human beings' relationship to the planet and all the other forms of life that inhabit it. That's a tall order. Where to start? Well, in the words of one of my favorite films, Jean-Luc Goddard's Tava Bien, to change everything, where do you start? Everywhere. Or as St. Paul puts it, our struggle is against the powers of this dark world. But as the author says, thankfully, none of us has to do everything. That's not how meaningful social change happens. You do what you can to help. People will free themselves. Find your work and do it. As W.E.B. Du Bois said about the lessons of John Brown, the cheapest price of liberty is its cost today. We got to get to work and we got to work together. Our liberation, our freedom, our salvation is tied up in one another. Abolish the borders between us, not out of pity or guilt, but in solidarity and justice. No Wall They Can Build is available from CrimeThink. Check the description, not just for a link to the free text of the book, but an audiobook version 
in the form of an 11-episode podcast. Thanks for watching. Thank you.